Hi friends, welcome to this module. I hope you are enjoying the cardiology clinical series lectures. And this is the last module. This involves two topics. Both are small topics. Both are complications of your uh, rheumatic heart disease. One is atrial fibrillation and pulmonary heart hypertension. Both are short topics. We should know certain basic idea about what exactly is happening and how exactly we need to treat these complications. So what is atrial fibrillation? Atrial fibrillation as you uh, as you have heard a lot of times, it is an irregularly regular rhythm, right? Irregularly regular. That means it is chaotic and it is rapid. So what is happening to the heart? Normally the SA node will initiate the impulse. It will be conducted at a rate of around 72 to 74 per minute. A normal sinus rhythm is between it is regular and it is between 60 to 100 beats per minute. Whereas in atrial fibrillation, what happens is there is disorganized, rapid and irregular atrial activation with loss of atrial contraction with an irregular ventricular rate. The atrium is not contracting at a regular rate and the ventricle is also not contracting as a regular rate because of the atrial you know, uh, irregularity. Basically, it is the most common sustained arrhythmia. Its prevalence increases with age and AF increases the risk of stroke by fivefold. That is the most dangerous thing. That's why we are very much concerned about this rhythm, atrial fibrillation. It increases the risk of stroke by fivefold and is the cause of around 25% of the strokes. Okay, that is the significance of atrial fibrillation. So how do you classify atrial fibrillation? We can classify this based on the duration into four varieties. One is a paroxysmal AF. That is, it terminates spontaneously within seven days and it is initiated usually by a small re-entrant or rapidly firing foci near the pulmonary vein. So the treatment what we will go is we will give drugs. There is a method called radio frequency ablation. We will go near the pulmonary vein and the atrial junction and just ablate the focus. Then the patient will be absolutely alright. The patient will be having sinus rhythm. So that is a method of treatment. That's why I have highlighted the fact that the ectopic foci is near the pulmonary vein. Okay. And persistent AF means persistent atrial fibrillation more than seven days. And long-standing atrial fibrillation is longer than one year. And permanent atrial fibrillation is long-standing AF refractory to cardioversion. So these are the four varieties of atrial fibrillation. Paroxysmal AF, persistent AF, long-standing atrial fibrillation and permanent atrial fibrillation. So what are the causes of atrial fibrillation? Yes, any idea? It can be remembered easily with the help of a mnemonic named THRILL. T for thyrotoxicosis, H for hypertension and heart failure, R for rheumatic heart disease, I for ischemic heart disease or infection, ischemic heart disease which includes myocardial infarction, especially right ventricular myocardial infarction, lone atrial fibrillation. Okay, these are the causes. T H R I L. This is a mnemonic to remember the causes of atrial fibrillation. T for thyrotoxicosis, H for hypertension, heart failure, R for rheumatic heart disease, I for ischemic heart disease and infection, L for low atrial fibrillation. Okay. So what are the symptoms of atrial fibrillation? Atrial fibrillation can cause palpitation because of the rapid chaotic rhythm. It can cause fatigue because the atrium is not contracting well, the ventricle is also not contracting well. It's uh, contracting at a rapid rate. And that means the blood flow which is received into the ventricle is also impaired and the blood which is pumped outside of the ventricle is also impaired. So it can cause fatigue, exertional dyspnea, effort intolerance and lightheadedness. Okay, these are the symptoms of atrial fibrillation. As you hear all about the atrial fibrillation, have you ever heard of a term by name sinus arrhythmia? Sinus arrhythmia, is it an abnormal or it's a normal rhythm? Arrhythmia, arrhythmia means abnormal rhythm, right? But this sinus arrhythmia is a normal finding. It is the increase in pulse rate with inspiration and decrease in pulse rate with expiration. So what is the reason for this? We have discussed already. It is your negative intrathoracic pressure during inspiration which pulls a lot of blood into the right side of the heart. And during inspiration what happens? The blood from the right side of the heart, okay, which is uh, pulled in, will be distributed into the lungs. So what happens to the left side of the heart? Basically, we receive blood through the inferior vena cava and superior vena cava into the right atrium and from the right atrium into the right ventricle, from the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery, into the lungs, then the pulmonary veins, then we receive this purified oxygenated blood into the left atrium, then into the left ventricle, then through the iota it is pumped out throughout the body. Yes or no? So what happens here during deep inspiration? During deep inspiration, blood is sucked into the right ventricle, right side of the heart, that is agreed but the blood is entering into the lungs whereas the quantity of blood which is in the left side of the heart is not much higher. So that causes a decrease in output. So what happens? 
in order to compensate for the decrease in output the heart rate increases this is by the carotid bodies okay so this normal physiological phenomenon that is an increase in pulse rate with inspiration decrease in pulse rate with expiration is called as sinus arrhythmia it is not a abnormal rhythm okay it's a physiological phenomenon it's more predominantly prominently seen in children and athletes okay as we discuss this there is there was one discussion what happens during our inspiration expiration to our bp or jvp so i just want to recollect this here also inspiration the pulse rate is accelerating here there is decelerating as i discussed the mechanism the blood pressure will fall but it is less than 10 mm of mercury whereas more than 10 mm fall is called as pulses paradoxes okay and uh, systolic bp rise with expiration jvp falls with inspiration rises with expiration s2 will be split whereas fused in expiration why s2 split because large amount of blood is flowing into the right side of the heart and it takes large amount of time for the right ventricle to empty into the pulmonaries so that that, that causes the valve the pulmonary valve to close a little later okay that causes the a2 p2 split understood yeah what is the difference between ventricular premature complex and atrial fibrillation we have uh, discussed in the previous uh, modules that there is a thing called pulse deficit that is very important parameter so pulse deficit less than 10 is ventricular premature complex whereas more than 10 suggests an atrial fibrillation a wave and jvp will be present in ventricular premature complex whereas absent in atrial fibrillation on exertion this ventricular premature complex can decrease or sometimes disappear also whereas this persists or increases in atrial fibrillation okay and the rhythm will be short pass vpc long pass whereas this atrial fibrillation will be variable and chaotic so these are the classic differences with which we can tell this patient is having a premature complex ventricular premature complex or a atrial fibrillation what is holiday heart syndrome holiday heart syndrome and this occurs in people with no structural heart disease and there will be paroxysmal tachycardia and the most common rhythm is your atrial fibrillation or ventricular arrhythmias can also happen this happens classically in people who drink heavily and temporarily okay this is a temporary finding occurs after heavy drinking okay this is also called as holiday heart syndrome okay so how will you say that this patient is having atrial fibrillation this is going to be an exam question so what are the findings which you which you tell number one your pulse it is an irregular irregular pulse yes okay we'll first tell about the rate then regularity the regularity itself will tell that this patient is having atrial fibrillation sometimes the rate will be very much controlled what drug will you give sometimes the patient will be digitalized or digoxin the digoxin is a very good drug which we will give to lot of patients because of its uh, you know it has a good control over the rhythm okay uh, sorry rate it has a good control over the rate that's why we give digoxin for lot of individuals with rheumatic heart disease with atrial fibrillation and that will control the rate so that it will be like uh, 60 to 70 the baseline heart rate will be 60 to 70 you may miss a atrial fibrillation so please palpate for at least 15 seconds 15 seconds to 30 seconds okay and then try to multiply so that you can take the exact rate and rhythm of an individual okay in patients who are treated with digoxin the rate may be very well controlled that it may be a abnormal rhythm okay and pulse deficit will be more than 10 in atrial fibrillation then jvp there will be absent a wave and in a patient with mitral stenosis okay um, there will be s1 that is very important finding before going to the mitral stenosis patient s1 any patient with atrial fibrillation if you auscultate the heart the s1 will be of variable intensity sometimes there will be a strongly contacting ventricle sometimes there will be a Uh, ventricle will be contracting of course but the blood amount of blood which is present in the ventricle will be lesser sometimes it will be more okay sometimes it will be a strong contraction sometimes it will be a weak contraction so that will cause a s1 of variable intensity s1 is basically caused by your closure of atrioventricular valves and this will be of variable intensity in a patient with atrial fibrillation if suppose that patient is having mitral stenosis then the pre systolic accentuation will be absent we remember that in mitral stenosis there will be a loud s1 and in after the s2 there will be opening snap mid diastolic murmur with the pre systolic accentuation which is caused by a, which is contributed by your atrial contraction okay so that atrial contraction the brisk atrial kick okay atrial contraction is also called as atrial kick okay which will also which will be impaired in the patient with atrial fibrillation okay so what are the ecg findings of atrial fibrillation just know these points okay no no need to go in depth into the ecg usually we observe p waves in two leads one is your lead 2 and another is v1 okay so this is your v1 and this is your 
lead to. So here you have to watch for P waves. Usually a P wave will be there, which indicates atrial contraction or atrial depolarization. Then a QRS complex will be there. Then a T wave will be there. So A wave, P wave indicates atrial depolarization. QRS indicates ventricular depolarization and T wave indicates ventricular repolarization. What happens to the atrial depolarization? It will be, you know, it will be hidden by the ventricular depolarization because ventricular depolarization is the stronger force. So that will hide the atrial depolarization. Understood? So what happens? What are the findings which suggest uh, atrial fibrillation in this patient? Varying RR interval. So RR interval. This is the R wave, right? This is the QRS complex R wave. So if you calculate the difference between these two complexes, they will be varying. Sometimes it will be shorter, sometimes it will be longer. So that is one finding. And there will not be any proper P wave. If you carefully observe here, there is no P wave. Okay. So what is this? This is called F waves or fibrillary waves. See some wavy pattern. Okay. This is called F waves or fibrillary waves. These are the classical findings. Varying RR interval, F waves, then atrial rate will be usually 300 to 600. Okay. Rapid rate. And ventricular rate will be around 150 to 200 okay so because the IV node is a speed breaker of the heart it will not allow all the impulses from the atrium to be carried in down into the ventricle okay so that ventricular rate will be around if it is a fast ventricular response it will be around 150 to 200 okay so how will you treat this individual treatment for an atrial fibrillation new onset atrial fibrillation that is less than 48 hours that produces severe hypotension pulmonary edema angina go for electrical cardioversion. Very, very important. Okay, new onset atrial fibrillation, which presents with hypotension, pulmonary edema or angina. So hemodynamic instability, new onset AF with hemodynamic instability. Then you go for electrical cardioversion with a shock of 200 joules. Okay, so what is the difference between defibrillation and cardioversion? Defibrillation we attempt for ventricular fibrillation, okay, and VT without pulse without pulse. So this is as per the ACLS protocol. Okay. A patient who is having cardiac arrest, who is unresponsive, will can have a four rhythms. Okay. Number one is asystole. Okay. Asystole. That is a flat line in the ECG. Next is a pulseless electrical activity. We will call it PEA. That is electrical activity will be there in the monitor, but there will not be any contractility at all. Okay. That is called as pulseless electrical activity. Other two which can cause such a hemodynamic collapse and uh, you know unresponsive patient is your ventricular fibrillation and VT without pulse, ventricular tachycardia without pulse. So for patients who are having asystole or PE, the treatment of choice is your CPR. Okay, just you have to compress the patient. Okay, and you give oxygenation to the patient, CPR. Okay, cardiac pulmonary resuscitation. Just give that alone. That is enough. Whereas for a patient with VT without pulse or a patient with ventricular fibrillation, the treatment of choice is defibrillation. What is the difference between defibrillation and cardioversion? We have discussed about cardioversion and the atrial fibrillation treatment rate. So cardioversion, what we do is we synchronize the shock with the QRS. There will be a button called synchronize in the defibrillator mission. Okay. So then what will be happening is that QRS complex will be marked by the machine itself. It is automated. So as soon as you press the button synchronize, the R will be marked and the shock will be delivered only during the QRS complex. Because if you deliver shock during the T wave, suddenly the patient can go for a ventricular fibrillation, can go for an arrest and may die, collapse in front of your eyes. That is the reason we have to give cardioversion, electrical cardioversion for a patient with atrial fibrillation. Understood? And if the patient is having atrial fibrillation for more than 48 hours or if the patient who has come to us, we don't know what is the duration of onset or the, what is the duration of atrial fibrillation, then you have to give anticoagulation for three weeks before and a minimum of four weeks after cardioversion. This is one methodology. If you want to perform a quick cardioversion, then you have to give an anticoagulant, then do a TEE, transesophageal echo. This is not available in all the centers. TTE, transthoracic echo, which is your place anteriorly over the chest is uh, uh, there in all, all centers, almost all centers in your country. But uh, transesophageal echo is found only in expert centers. Okay, you have to do a TEE, rule out a clot, clot especially in the left atrial appendage. Remember, it is very, very important point. In atrial fibrillation, the site of formation of clot is your left atrial appendage. Left atrial appendage. All the atrium will not contract properly, but the most common site for left atrial clot formation is your left atrial appendage. Okay. And if there is 
uh, the thrombosis is not there then you can go ahead for cardioversion after cardioversion the same you have to give anticoagulation for minimum of four weeks why is that so because the mechanical contractility of the ventral atrium will take around four weeks to recover fully okay as soon as atrial fibrillation occurs the atrium will be stunned it will not be able to contract properly it takes around four weeks for the atrial contractility to improve okay what are the drugs which are available for cardioversion this is called electrical cardioversion whereas what is chemical cardioversion this is your drugs so most common drugs are propafenone and flecainate okay these are the two antiarrhythmics propafenone and flecainate i'll write so propafenone okay propafenone 300 mg flecainate Two hundred milligram, hundred to two hundred. This is three hundred to six hundred milligram maximum. Okay, so this is the dose for the your pharmacological cardio version. Okay, if the patient is having chronic atrial fibrillation, is like that. I am having this for the past few years uh, like that. Then what is the best strategy? Rate control versus rhythm control. There are trials indicating that rate control is enough. No need to go for aggressive rhythm control. That means no need to cardio him to sinus rhythm. Just rate control itself is having good outcome. Okay. So what is the target heart rate you have to control? Resting heart rate of less than 80 or up to 100 to 110 with exertion. Okay. Not with heavy exertion. So like walking. Okay. Like climbing steps. Climbing steps. Then the rate should be less than 110. This is the target. So the first best drug of choice will be your beta blocker. The second drug will be your non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker that is your verapamil or diltiazem okay or a combination of both if the patient is having heart failure then you cannot give calcium channel blockers beta blockers yes heart failure we can give but calcium channel blockers will impact the contractility very much so you're not supposed to give calcium channel blockers to a patient with heart failure in that case you can go ahead for digoxin okay and in lot of patients in our patients which we encounter in our community we give digoxin okay and uh, the next most important step is anticoagulation. For any patient with valvular heart disease with atrial fibrillation, you should give anticoagulation. For non-valvular heart disease, then you non-valvular cause of atrial fibrillation, then you can go ahead for a scoring called Chad Vasi scoring. Okay, for any patient with valvular heart disease with atrial fibrillation, you should give anticoagulation. Okay, that is very important. So, what we are giving commonly warfarin therapy with an INR target of two to three, international normalized ratio target of two to three okay so before initiating warfarin what is important it, it should give always give heparin first then to bridge to warfarin okay this is called bridging therapy first give heparin then give warfarin what is the reason because warfarin indicate indi like warfarin uh, like increases the risk of thrombosis by decreasing your natural anticoagulants in the body first okay initially it inhibits your protein protein C and protein S in your body. These protein C and protein S are beneficial to the body. They are basically natural anticoagulants. But these are inhibited first by your warfarin. So that will create a prothrombotic state if you give only warfarin. Okay. So be very careful. You should always start along with heparin. Okay. You, you can start warfarin only along with heparin. Then once the INR reaches more than 2, okay, you can stop the heparin. Understood? This is called bridging therapy. Very, very important. Bridging therapy. Fine. There are a lot of newer anticoagulants. Can we give in all patients with atrial fibrillation? No. When valvular heart disease, valvular heart disease with atrial fibrillation, you are supposed to give warfarin or acitrom. Citrom is also an analog. Okay. These two can be given. Whereas for non-valvular atrial fibrillation, there are a lot of newer anticoagulants which you can give like dabigatran. Okay. Dabigatran 110 BD like that we give. Okay. This is the Chad Vasi score. Very important for a patient with non-valvular heart disease, non-valvular atrial fibrillation. So in that case, this is the score. Okay. So there are two variables which can which has score of two, age more than or equal to 75, and stroke TAA or embolus. This is these are the two variables with score of two. Others have score of one. C for congestive heart failure, H for hypertension, A for age more than or equal to 75 years, D for diabetes, S for stroke TAA or embolus, V for vascular disease, A for age 65 to 75, and S for sex. That is female sex especially okay these are the this is a scoring system which can be employed in a patient with non valvular atrial fibrillation to decide whether this patient will need a anticoagulant or not okay so if the score is zero then no need to give anything okay nothing give nothing okay if the score is one then you can give aspirin if the score is two 
or more than two, then you have to give anticoagulants. Okay, so you have to give anticoagulants. All right. So, is there any bleeding score? This score is for predicting the stroke risk. Actually, actually the increase in score will suggest an increase in risk of stroke. Okay, that is very helpful. And there is one score called has blood score. Okay, so to predict bleeding, you are giving anticoagulants. Okay, there is less than one percent risk of hemorrhagic stroke in these patients. That is very dangerous. So there is a score called has blood score that will predict the risk of bleeding in a patient. Understood? So before finishing this uh, module on atrial fibrillation, I'd like to tell about digoxin because it is very commonly used. So it blocks the sodium potassium ATPase and increases the refractiveness of AV node so that it decreases the your ventricular rates. Okay, so to control the ventricular rate, we give digoxin and the usual dosage is 0.125 to 0.25 milligram once daily. We'll give for five days in a week only to avoid toxicity. Okay, and its most common earliest adverse effect is nausea and vomiting. And most common cardiac adverse effect is arrhythmia, that is your ventricular bijemia, that is most common. Others adverse effects include xanthopsia, that is yellow vision or gynecomastia. Okay. And what are the contraindications? Electrolyte abnormalities, especially hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia and hypercalcemia. Very, very important. In WPW syndrome and renal failure because it is really excreted. Okay. So these are the contraindications for digoxin. So WP syndrome, what happens is there will be an apparent pathway which connects the atrium and the ventricle. Okay. So if you block the AV node, then you, the conduction will go along with the apparent pathway that will trigger a malignant ventricular, ventricular arrhythmias and can cause death also. So that is the danger with digoxin in a patient with WPW syndrome. Okay. This Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. Okay. There will be a short PR interval. There will be a delta wave in ECG. These are the findings which can suggest a Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. Okay. So now we'll go into a clinical question which is irrelevant to the topic, present topic of discussion. But it is important for your clinical practice. What is Faget sign? Faget sign. Okay. Before Faget sign, kindly recall what is your relative tachycardia. For every one degree rise in temperature, there should be 10 beats per minute increase in heart rate. Whereas, if a patient is having more than 10 beats per minute increase in heart rate for every one degree rise in fever, that is called relative tachycardia. Similarly, if the patient is having for every one degree rise in temperature, there is drop in heart rate, then it is called as phaget sign. Okay, very, very important. And before going further, I would like to ask one question. What is fever? What is fever? What is the temperature cutoff? Okay, it is 98.9 degree Fahrenheit at AM and 99.9 .9 degree Fahrenheit at PM. Okay, more than 98.9 degree Fahrenheit in a AM, more than 99.9 .9 degree Fahrenheit in PM because of the cortisol change. Okay, diurnal change. This is the cutoff for telling a patient that you have fever. Okay, and one of your friends asked a doubt about drug fever. What is a drug fever? Okay, sometimes some antibiotics which we give inadvertently will cause a fever. Okay, some drugs can cause fever. Not only antibiotics, some drugs can also cause fever. So how to differentiate with the other causes? So what we do is, if a patient is coming for chronic fever, like two weeks, three weeks fever, we'll stop all the drugs. Okay, unless he is like severely hemodynamic compromised, then we can we have to continue antibiotics. And we don't know the cause of fever, this continuing, 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 then we'll stop all the drugs. Okay, ask them to wait for three days. If the patient is having, you know, uh, like the fever subsides within three days, then the patient probably would have a had a drug fever okay but if the fever passes more than 72 hours then it is irrelevant to the drug which the patient was taking okay this is called drug fever okay and phage sign this phage sign is relative bradycardia that means for increase in temperature there is no increase in heart rate that can happen with typhoid brucella lepto drug induced fever and factitious fever okay so these are the causes where there can be relative bradycardia that is called as phage sign Typhoid, brucella, lepto, drug induced fever, and factitious fever. Okay. So, next coming to the uh, another important side effects of your adverse effect of your like a uh, complication of your atrial uh, rheumatic heart disease, there is pulmonary hypertension. Yes, we discussed about atrial fibrillation, it can increase the risk of stroke. Okay, so we have to give anticoagulation can increases the heart rate and unnecessarily cut and due fatigue so you have to rate control here there is another complication named pulmonary hypertension that means there is increase in blood pressure in the pulmonary vasculature we discussed about second stenosis the first stenosis is your mitral stenosis whereas the second stenosis can occur in the pulmonary circulation because of the mitral stenosis okay so this pulmonary hypertension is also called as second stenosis 
So what happens is there is elevation in the pulmonary artery pressures. Mean pulmonary artery pressure more than 25 or systolic pulmonary artery pressure more than 36. This is the cutoff for telling that a patient is having pulmonary hypertension. Okay. So before going further, I'd like to highlight on the normal pressures. The normal left atrial pressure is 4 to 12 millimeter mercury. Left ventricle is your 90 to 140 systolic. Okay. Diastolic is the diastolic is same as the LA. That is 4 to 12. And normal RA pressure is 0 to 8 and RV pressure is 15 to 30. Okay, end diastolic is same as RA pressure. And pulmonary artery pressure is 15 to 30. So the same RV systolic pressure is the same pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Diastolic is 8 to 15. Okay. So iota pressure, you know, okay, this normal blood pressure, 130 80. Yes. So this pressure should just have an idea, just have a like a, so that you will understand in the next subsequent uh, discussions. Okay. You need not be like, uh, uh, this is very important. RA pressure can tell you whether you have to give you can give more fluids in a patient with shock. Looking at the RA pressure, okay, like you are doing an ultrasound or looking at the vena cava, then that will tell you whether to give fluids aggressively or the patient is already filled in. Okay, so there are certain clues which you can with, get with the help of these pressures. But ideally, these pressures can be measured with the help of catheterization. You will introduce a catheter during the jugular vein and then you will measure exact pressure at all these areas. Okay, during the catheter called Swan Gans catheter. Swan Gans okay, catheter. Okay, that is very important. And to look at the left atrial pressure, there is an indirect measurement that is called pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. That reflects your left atrial pressure. This you remember. Okay. So, left atrium, we can put the catheter. We will put catheter usually through this route, right atrium, right ventricle. Then you will enter into the pulmonary artery, pulmonary artery and pulmonary capillaries. So, if you wedge that area, okay, if you block that area, then you can directly measure the pressure of your left atrium that is called as pulmonary capillary wedge pressure okay that indirectly tells you the left atrial pressure understood okay so what are the symptoms of pulmonary hypertension it is once again the same symptom as your aortic stenosis but remember in the early phase there will not be any symptom asymptomatic so if a patient is coming with exertional dyspnea then you can suspect this patient can go for a pulmonary hypertension Okay, this can patient, especially a 25 to 30 year old individual coming with exertional dyspnea, suspect pulmonary hypertension. And the symptoms will be syncope, chest pain, fatigue and exertional dyspnea. And late stage there will be right heart failure features. That is your ascites, spedal edema like that. Okay. Now tell me what is ascites precox, precox. Okay. A-S-C-I-T-E-S, -E ascites precox. Usually what is the pattern is? After the pedal edema comes, then only the ascites will develop. Okay, whereas in ascites precox, the ascites will come first, then comes the pedal edema. That can come with two cardiac conditions. One is your constrictive pericarditis and another is your restrictive cardiomyopathy. Okay, constrictive pericarditis and restrictive cardiomyopathy can cause ascites coming before your pedal edema. That is called as ascites precox. Understood? And any patient with pedal edema, always look at the JVP. If the JVP is elevated in a patient with pedal edema, then the cause is cardiac. Okay, these are some tips, practical tips. Right, so how will you classify the pulmonary hypertension? Okay, there are five groups of pulmonary hypertension. Number one is pulmonary arterial hypertension. And the idiopathic variety will come under this. And the heritable variety with BMPR mutation, BMPR, bone morphogenic protein mutation, will also come under this group. Okay, group one, pulmonary arterial hypertension. Group 2 is pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease like your mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation. Okay. Pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease. Next comes your pulmonary hypertension due to lung disease or hypoxia. The diagnosis includes COPD or ILD. Okay. Lot of other causes. Even your, you know, obesity, hypoventilation syndrome, your uh, OSA can also cause pulmonary hypertension. Remember that. And group 4 includes your chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension and other pulmonary artery uh, obstructions. Okay. And group 5 includes pulmonary hypertension with unclear or multifactory mechanisms like, uh, you know, hematological causes also there. Okay. Sickle cell anemia can cause pulmonary hypertension. Schistosomiosis can cause pulmonary hypertension. Okay. Sarcoidosis can cause pulmonary hypertension. These are variety of causes which can cause pulmonary hypertension. Your ASD, VSD, PDA can also cause pulmonary hypertension. Okay. So, a variety of causes of pulmonary hypertension. The classification is mainly we grouped into five types. One is your pulmonary arterial hypertension. Next is your pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease. Next is your lung disease. Next is your thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And five is multi unclear or multifactor mechanisms. Okay. What is carpulmonary? What is the relevance with pulmonary hypertension? Carpulmonary is also called as pulmonary heart disease. Okay. 
it is the altered rv structure or function in the context of chronic lung disease and triggered by presence of pulmonary hypertension okay, it is all altered rv structure and or function in the context of chronic lung disease lung, lung disease causing heart failure that is called carpal simple definition lung disease causing heart failure okay and it is triggered usually in the presence of your pulmonary hypertension remember the most common cause of right heart failure is left heart failure okay this is very important most common cause of right heart failure is left heart failure but when the lung disease is causing right heart failure that is called is carpal nail now tell me what is acute carpal nail okay acute carpal nail acutely when do when which lung disorder can cause an acute right heart failure it is your acute pulmonary embolism okay so pulmonary embolism suddenly blocks your pulmonary artery can acutely cause a right heart failure so that is called as acute carpal nail okay acute problem is uh, acute carpal nail is other name of acute pulmonary embolism so what are the clinical features of pulmonary hypertension yes signs include low volume pulse why because the right ventricular blood is not able to reach the left ventricle because there is pulmonary hypertension the blood is not able to pump forward okay and neck veins will show a prominent a wave okay prominent a wave in jvp will tell you your pulmonary hypertension right cannot a wave well where does it occur it occurs in av dissociation your complete heart block okay central cyanosis can occur especially in right to left shunt and lung diseases what is right to left shunt left to right shunt is your purified left systemic circulation mixing with your pulmonary circulation okay that is called left right shunt when does how does right to right, right to left shunt occurs if the blood from the right ventricle which is your deoxygenated blood is not getting oxygenated while it passes through your pulmonary circulation and mixes going into the left side of the heart that is called your right to left shunt so interstitial lung disease in COPD what happens is the capillaries will you know not be able to oxygenate properly so the deoxygenated blood in the right ventricle will go into the left side of the heart through your pulmonary artery lung capillaries then into the pulmonary veins and into the left atrium without getting properly oxygenated that is called your right to left shunt okay fine next most important finding uh, what are the findings what are the signs in your um, general examination after coming into the cardiovascular examination per se what can what else can you find inspection can suggest your visible pulsation left second intercostal space and epigastric pulsation epigastric pulsation occurs one because of a your um, tricuspid regurgitation that is one one cause okay tricuspid regurgitation can be reflected in the um, hepatic okay hepatic pulsation another is your rvh right ventricular hypertrophy can be seen as an epigastric pulsation okay and palpation apex goes out so outwards we discussed already left ventricular enlargement especially eccentric hypertrophy can cause down and out apex beat whereas right ventricular enlargement just push laterally okay and palpable p2 is also called as diastolic shock okay palpable p2 any heart sound which is palpable is also called as shock okay this is a other name shock yes, so she has uh, so any heart sound which is palpable can be called as shock and here there will be p2 will be palpable that is called as diastolic shock left to parasternal heave can be there because of right ventricular hypertrophy and pulsation of pulmonary artery may be felt in the upper left to parasternal area okay auscultation will reveal a pulmonary ejection click there are certain points which we discussed already right what are what about the, what are the classical points i discussed about pulmonary ejection click all the right sided heart sounds will increase with inspiration except your pulmonary ejection click all the left sided sounds will all left sided heart sounds will increase with expiration so i don't all mnemonic also l e f t left l for left and e for expiration r i g h t r for right and i for inspiration okay this is the classical point to be remembered okay and exception is pulmonary ejection click there can be an ejection systolic member because in the pulmonary artery there is obstruction right relative obstruction since the pressure in the pulmonary artery is more the valve will not be able to open towards the pulmonary artery yes or no lot of pressure in the pulmonary artery so the valve is not able to open fully and that can cause an ejection systolic member in the pulmonary artery in the pulmonary area close splitting of s2 will be there that we discussed already because of the pulmonary hypertension and graham steel member as the pulmonary hypertension progresses the pulmonary valve ring will dilate and that can lead to your pulmonary regurgitation also so that will that is the diastolic decrescent of murmur due to pulmonary valve ring dilatation what else murmur can be here heard it is your functional tricuspid regurgitation because the blood is not able to be pushed forward into the pulmonary artery some amount of blood will be leaking into the right atrium through the tricuspid valve that is your functional tricuspid regurgitation okay and cause of death in these patients is your decompensated right heart failure a patient with pulmonary hypertension going for death 
is because of your recomp decompensator right heart failure and there can also be S3, S4 in the presence of failure. Okay. Right. This is the mechanism, the pulmonary ejection click. Why does it, you know, softens with inspiration? Basically, to occur, the pulmonary ejection click to occur, there should be dooming followed by opening. Then only the click will be heard. Whereas during inspiration, what happens is lot of pressure, lot of blood will be there in the right atrium, right ventricular, so increased pressure. The valve is already in dooming position. Okay. So the opening will not produce much sound. Whereas during expiration, what happens is less amount of blood in the uh, right atrium, right ventricle, so the right ventricle pressure is less, so the valve, valve will be in normal position, okay, and it will doom upwards and then open, that will produce a click, okay, that is the reason why the pulmonary ejection click is not increasing with inspiration, already the valve is in dooming position, so opening will not produce any much sound, okay. Now tell me, what is the cause of, what is the Eisenmenger syndrome, Eisenmenger syndrome, any idea? Cyanotic congenital heart disease with the initial large systemic to pulmonary shunt. Okay, what is this? What is the meaning of that? For example, take an ASD or a VSD. What happens initially, the systemic circulation will be 120, like pressure will be 120 kilometer mercury, right? So what happens is the blood from the left side of the heart, okay, the oxygenated blood will enter into the right side of the heart. That is the deoxygenated side. Okay, the VSD, blood will enter from the left ventricle to the right ventricle. And ASD, the blood will enter from the left atrium to the right ventricle, right atrium. Whereas what happens is, as time passes, okay, that will produce a pulmonary vasculopathy with pulmonary hypertension. Gradually, the pressure in the pulmonary artery will increase, okay, the more than systemic circulation and that will lead to reversal of shunt and central cyanosis. This is called as Eisenmenger syndrome, okay. Initially, there will be a left to right shunt, which is changed into a right to left shunt as the pulmonary hypertension develops. That is called as Eisenmenger syndrome, okay, right. So. Let's discuss the hemodynamics here. What happens in the ASD? Blood from the left atrium will go into the right atrium. We discussed now, normal pressure of right atrium is 0 to 8, whereas left atrium it is 4 to 12. So the increasing pressure will favor flow into the right atrium from the left atrium. Some amount of blood will go into the left ventricle and lot of blood will go through the tricuspid valve. So there, there can be, we can hear a mid diastolic murmur. Okay. Whereas in VSD, what happens is lot of blood okay, will flow through the Mitral valve because blood is some amount of blood is going from the iota like the ventricle into the iota, some amount is leaking into the right ventricle. So there will be turbulence here in the mitral area and mitral valve that will produce a mid diastolic member, functional mid diastolic member in a patient with VSD or PDA also similar mechanism. Okay, iota to pulmonary artery shunting will be there, large amount of flow will blood will flow through the left side of the heart and that will produce a mid diastolic member in the mitral area. Understood? What is means Lerman scratch? Anything relevant to pulmonary hypertension? Nothing. Okay. It is a scratchy sound. Okay. Pluropericardial sound, rubbing sound. Heard in patients with hyperthyroidism. Means Lerman scratch. Okay. This is a new term. I agree. Means Lerman scratch. Means Lerman scratch. It is a pluropericardial rub heard in the pulmonary area in a patient with hyperthyroidism. Okay. Fine. Tell me how will you treat a pulmonary hypertension? How to treat a pulmonary hypertension? There are drugs available. If there is no cure, you just have to control okay, the pulmonary hypertension. Number one is an endothelin receptor antagonist which includes bosentan, ambrisentan, macetentan. Okay, these are best drugs. Bosentan, ambrisentan, and macetentan. PDE5 inhibitor include your sildenafil and tadalafil. Sildenafil is short half-life, whereas tadalafil has half-life up to 48 hours. Okay, remember, nitrates are contraindicated with patients with PDE5 inhibitor usage because nitrates can cause refractory hypotension in patients with PDE5 inhibitor usage. Very, very important. Okay, and process cycling derivatives can cause your pulmonary artery dilatation, hypoprosyl, triposyl, and soluble gonadal cycle stimulators, a new drug, Riosiguat. Riosiguat. Okay, so these are the drugs used for treatment of your pulmonary hypertension. Number one is your endothelial interceptor antagonist. Number two is your PD5 inhibitors. Number three is your process cycling derivative. Number four is your soluble gonadal cyclase stimulator. Okay. So having come to the end of this module, um, what I would like to tell you in conclusion is, remember in your exams, okay, or in wherever you go, formulating a differential diagnosis is very, very important. Okay. You don't you need not give a proper diagnosis. You, not, you need not be right at the proper diagnosis, but you have to give, you should be able to give a differential diagnosis for whatever findings you commit. Okay. So you should be able to tell the favorable points, the positive points for your differential diagnosis. 
and you should be able to justify based on your examination findings okay telling that the trachea is pushed to the right side and telling that there is a right side and massive pleural effusion you know doesn't 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 make sense right if there is left side a big pleural effusion the trachea will be pushed to the right side yes or no so you should be very careful whatever findings you commit in the examination it should tell you it should lead you to a proper differential diagnosis or a diagnosis very 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 important okay and uh, so not necessary remember not necessary that you give a proper diagnosis whatever you say you should be able to justify okay whatever points you ask in the history you should be able to tell an explanation why did you ask you, you, you should you are answerable for that okay and remember practical exam is the gateway to the internship because uh, in lot of exams lot of centers if you pass in the practicals you are an intern no doubt because in theory exams you know you have learned pathology pathology liver liver is there in the right side of the abdomen i know that okay so you can turn right side abdomen pain you can write okay whatever you know like just thinking where exactly is the organ what function it is doing by merely thinking that you can write a story on that okay so just you should know which system it is then you can write story liver means okay jaundice okay like hyperalbuminemia okay fine so you can write generate uh, you know statements based on that based on that but in uh, practical exam should be very careful you should give up to the point answer okay and if you have to impress the examiner to secure, secure like good good marks okay and i suggest you revise these modules again and again okay before your practical exams whatever i have taught okay almost i have covered all about uh, cardiovascular system you can you can like whatever point you feel like you can see the videos before the exams you can revise all these videos once okay with your notes so that you have you have a visual output audio output okay and a video output so that will help you okay visual audio output will help you to recollect and remember things better okay so you can use this module as many times as possible and of course i would like that uh, i recommend that you can pass this video to your juniors your next generation so that they would also be benefited okay and uh, so in the end i told no more the expected thing is you should be able to justify what you are telling okay and at the same time you should be polite don't fight with the examiner okay and how to study for the examinations that is very important question and next next uh, what is need what is next need to you know understand i have a lot of ideas because lot of coaching classes or conducting classes not like that okay next is going to be similar to need only okay much practical oriented so you should spend time properly on your your practical books practical modules whatever you have kindly spend proper time with your practical books okay very very important and you have to read learn and solve okay these are the three tips which i would like to give you read reading means extensive reading like you can read textbooks okay and read textbooks first then come to your entrance classes or entrance modules because textbook learning give you in depth understanding and in depth retention okay than your entrance class entrance class will give you just the points with some understanding okay that is not going to matter being an mbbs doctor when you come out you should be able to you know have some confidence some retention about what you have learned okay just merely mem memorizing mcqs with some understanding doesn't going to help you in whatever you are going to do so please read textbooks properly then you learn you write down notes okay and then you can go for solving mcqs okay this is what i suggest organized reading what is organized reading is when you are reading anatomy and physiology you don't know what exactly is going to be the next year third year and all okay but when you are mature you are going to become a final year student you know what is what has been discussed in anatomy is going to get correlated in your surgery and your orthopedics right and what you have learned in your physiology okay physiology is a normal function which is altered in pathology and the treatment which you are going to is pharmacology and the clinical science and manifestation is your medicine if you have a strong basic understanding strong knowledge on your physiology pathology and pharmacology and if you integrate everything like for example i am going to treat cardiovascular system take physiology revise then you take pathology and revise then come to medicine see the clinical features the manifestation the investigation and the treatment and treatment which includes drugs you can go go to the pharmacology book and revise that so that will give you a complete idea i have integrated approach this is not happening in india of course because of the schedule that uh, syllabus which we have anatomy physio bio chemistry first year like that but in abroad all they are doing this cardiovascular system they will start from embryology anatomy physiology pathology okay then you they will go for a clinical manifestation treatment and then go to pharmacology which includes pharmacology so this is how okay, your approach should be very very clear okay you should have a broad idea okay how it started how it ends okay so that organized reading can be done with the help of your uh, proper uh, learning technique okay that one idea is your 
reading the textbooks whatever you have learnt in your previous days just revise and go ahead write and write in a book okay have a proper physiology then you will know what all to write in your theory exam very very easy if you know the physiology you can write what is pathology what is the clinical science right so that is very very important and even entrance classes will give you that organized learning you can see one video in your uh, anatomy then go for a like a then go for go and read the surgery okay that is very useful for understanding and ret retaining okay so for retaining you should do this approach okay and of course pediatrics is also linked to medicine only except for the seven eight chapters in the op guide the first seven eight chapters will be of new topics like oh, vaccination neonatology like that but all of the topics will be integrated with your medicine also so you need not take separate time read the same topic in two books just know the pediatric aspects in the op guide that is enough to shine your exams okay that approach should be there understood so that is called as integrated ap approach and that is called as organized reading okay and next most important thing is mcq solving so after you read properly take any mcq book or any recent mcq book just see solve mcqs and whatever mcqs you are getting you can add to your notes okay that makes your notes sound okay and that will be very helpful for your entrance preparation as well and next is nothing great okay if you read this properly if you do spend your time properly have an organized reading and if you solve you know how to solve mcqs okay solving mcqs is an art basically my friend used to tell me okay it's like driving as you drive you know you can drive without uh, like much of stress and strain similarly you need initially when you solve mcqs you will feel uh, you will feel difficult to solve but as you solve again and again then you will get the trick of solving mcqs and then you can shine easily okay and uh, this is a fam famous quote a favorite quote my professor dr kk perumal used to tell me often okay alavatra nenjurudi talavatra ukam ayaradu olaippu nermiyana paadai basically perseverance motivation hard work and honesty these are the four tips that will take you to success okay i'll repeat again alavatra nenjurudi talavatra ukam ayaradu olaippu nermiyana paadai it's my one of my favorite professors who have inspired me to take up medicine okay, dr kk perumal uh, so Sir is a wonderful person, and uh, so he used to repeat this often, and he used to motivate me to work more. Okay, and I'm feeling thankful, grateful to him now. And so, basically, uh, God has a plan for you. Like, uh, so, purpose for your pain, reason for your struggle, reward for your faithfulness, and trust him, and don't give up. Give up. Okay, and for becoming a good doctor, you should always have lateral thinking. Okay, so for example, if you take a one question, medical causes of abdomen pain. Any patient with abdomen pain, they will think that it's a problem, problem surgical cause. Abdomen pain, surgical cause, like that. But as a good doctor, you should be able to think and rule out the medical cause before giving it to your surgeon. For example, a diabetic ketosis, or if you have a myocardial infarction, or Addison's disease, or sickle cell crisis, or your porph porphyria, there are a lot of medical causes of abdomen pain. Oh, we should be ruled out before. taking a patient for surgery so that lateral thinking will be given by your broad reading okay extensive reading extensive listening okay and extensive you know uh, recollection of things okay whatever you have learned okay and application of things whatever you have learned that is very very important okay and now again once again i would like to uh, take this opportunity to thank my god almighty okay and uh, i am thank especially the ime msn network your uh, indian medical association medical students network for giving me this opportunity my family members my teachers okay my patients my friends all the my friends who are motivated in this endeavor and all the best for your practical exams okay and do mail me all your questions queries whatever your teachers ask if you're not if you are confused whatever you feel you can mail me or send me in the whatsapp in this number okay, it will be of great help and uh, one more thing is your give a proper feedback okay i may give a separate feedback form also if possible kindly fill the feedback and send it to me so that uh, i'll get to know what are the things which i need to improve in my teaching so that will be helpful for my future endeavors okay and uh, so before um, ending this uh, i would like to thank my wife uh, who had uh, given me like uh, so much time freedom to do all these modules to make to reach you all guys okay and her uh, birthday i would like to wish her a happy birthday and i thank you all the all you guys okay please be confident you know be strong in your subjects okay and you will become a great doctors all the very best thank you